Okay, so welcome everybody to this sixth top webinar. Let me just share my screen for a brief introduction here. Well, so today is the first thematic session and the focus is on large scale and efficient topology optimization approaches. And my name is uh, Nils O, and I'm gonna be the host of today. I come from the Technical University of Denmark. So the motivation, so why even doing these thematic sessions? Well, we want to bring people together and then doing these thematic sessions is all about presenting current state of the art. And then since it's a fairly confined research area that we're discussing, we should also discuss future directions. So I guess questions today can go in any direction and hopefully we'll, we'll put out some pathways to follow for both young and older researchers. So why large scale, if you were thinking that? Well, first of all, it's of course, it's fun, but I think the more general approach to large scale is that now we are pretty much the topology optimization approaches out there. They are at a level where we guess we could with some confidence say we're done with components. The next target is full structures. This means that we need large scale to do that. And uh, once we have that, then we're gonna learn so much more because as complexity increases and multi-physics occur, I mean, the solution spaces are just so much more complicated to understand from a human being side. So what do I mean? And what do this session mean with large scale and efficient? Well, of course it starts with the, I guess the fundamentals of large scale, which is high performance computing and methods developed specifically for running on massively parallel computers or clusters. But on the other hand, I mean, this is not a place that you should always start your research. So desktop methods are very much uh, attractive, not just from a research point of view, but also for small startups. I mean, not everybody has access to gigantic clusters. So whatever you can make run efficiently on desktop is, uh, should be promoted very heavily. And then also the concept of prototyping so we're also going to hear talks about that because, I mean, prototyping in, 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 in low-level programming languages can be quite complicated. So being able to do prototyping and getting the results fast is really important. So we're going to hear about that as well. And then we're going to talk about efficient optimizers. There could be stuff about filters and all the other components that goes into topology optimization, just seen in a broader context. So I should also here mention that this means that there are way more topics than sexually covered in today's four talks. And this is definitely not because I'm trying to exclude anybody. It's simply just because I could fill up, let's say a week, conferences or full of, uh, sessions, full of talks every day on these subjects. So please don't feel left out. If you feel you should have been invited, actually feel free to write me because I'm quite sure there's gonna be another one, maybe not hosted by me, but another one on large scales. But I do feel I need to tell you a thing or two about what is not included today. So first of all, there's no talks on GPUs and stuff is happening with respect to top up and GPUs, but not much has happened since 15, 16. Things are pretty much still the same. So, and this is kind of a, a weird thing because the new machines are actually full of, of, of uh, GPUs. So let that be uh, an advertisement for young people especially to go out and show how they can be used. And then also the concept of artificial intelligence in terms of large scale topology optimization. Well, it still needs, as I see it, and I guess many others, it still needs to be demonstrated that it actually works for, for large scale problems at least. So also a challenge for the young ones. So what are we gonna hear about today? Well, Boyan is gonna present on the high performance computing part especially focusing on how to solve linear system equations, which is the bottleneck if you go large scale and do top ups. We're also gonna hear about uh, uh, fast methods for prototyping in MATLAB from Federico. And then we're gonna hear about something really interesting. I mean, a lot of fun happens when people from outside your own field goes into it. So the graphics community have provided us several tools over the years. And uh, we're gonna hear about one where you are where they are able to produce single computer gigavoxel results. 
And then there's a peculiarity from a mechanical engineer like me. Not really much has happened on to, M, to uh, optimizers since the late 1980s. I mean, everybody is basically using the same MMA algorithm, which is 40 or 30 something years old now. But it does seem that something is happening with the when the field of augmented the gradients and local constraints. So we're also gonna hear something about that. And lastly, I just wanna do a small advertisement for the ISMO event this June, or not this June, June 21, which is the virtual WTSMO 14 conference was supposed to be in Boulder. Now it's gonna be virtual, but anyways, here's the advertisement. I hope many of you will find the time and participate in that event to make it a Great success. So uh, let me just skip sharing and then see if we have gotten Brian along. No, I don't think so. I guess we will start, or not guess, we will then start with you, Federico, presenting. Great. MATLAB code. Yep, please take it away. Yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you hear my voice? Yes, I guess. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks for inviting me to present this work that I have recently done with Ole at DTU and that we extended with Jamie Guest at Johns Hopkins University. And so I'm going to introduce the motivation. So why to write a new MATLAB code? Uh, the top uh, opt MATLAB application from 2011 was quite uh, fast back then, but uh, in part because of the evolution of MATLAB in itself, and in part because of the introduction of some highly efficient methods for solving linear equations, if you uh, try to profile the uh, top opt today, you will see that actually quite a lot of time is uh, uh, spent on operations that we would like to be more or less for free, like this assemblage of the matrices is absorbing a relevant part of the time in all the cases. And when you go on fine meshes with high uh, radius of the filters, the OC step will also increase his weight. So we decided in principle to share some uh, knowledge and that we got through the time and some speed ups that we discovered and to build a code that is again, well balanced, meaning that it spends the vast majority of the time in solving the linear system. So uh, we tried to keep the structure as close to the top, uh, the previous top opt the code as possible. And we decided to include various um, flexibilities by default. So you can specify some passive domains, you can choose the boundary conditions for the filter that now is uh, uh, built, but the very fast EM, the filter MATLAB routine, and you can choose to do uh, filtering uh, loan or filtering plus the ETA projection and in principle, you can also compute a volume preserving threshold for the projection. And this will uh, substantially speed up the OC because you don't have to repeatedly apply the filter. And uh, finally, uh, you can specify the continuation scheme for both the simp exponent and for the uh, sharpness beta for the projection. So the main speed ups uh, regard the stiffness matrix setup, uh, the filtering operations and the OC update. And I will short discuss these points in a few slides. Then uh, as a first extension to the code we decided to 
include uh, an overall acceleration strategy that we took from the research from the people uh, in the group of Professor Pa U. Lino, and essentially they dug back in the 60s and they resumed a method that can uh, cut the overall uh, optimization the time by making all the problem to converge faster. Now, here I reported some, oh, sorry, here I reported some examples that uh, you might run uh, with different setups for the filter and the continuation schemes and looking at the computational performance in the table here, um, um, you can see that this average, the time per iteration is pretty, is pretty small. And on the finest mesh, I would say this is a rather fine mesh, you just spend less than six seconds for one update step. And uh, the numbers in red are the speed ups with respect to the codes uh, top 80 of eight. And this one with the U is the same one as this one, but with some speed ups that were suggested in the code from 2011. And if we look at the relative time here, uh, you can see that now the vast majority of the time is actually spent on the solution of the equilibrium equations and all these other operations become very priceless. And, uh, and um, this is precisely the situation that we wanted to reach. Now, another nice thing is that the extension to 3D is really simple. In principle, you just have to change a few lines of code for implementing a different finite element and for some reshape operations here and there in order to account for the third dimension. And also here, we can compare the performance to the uh, multi-grid code uh, of 2014 from uh, Amir and some others. And uh, as you can see here in the code of 2014, because the multigrid uh, PCG is uh, very, very fast, uh, you spend a lot of the time in setting up your linear equation more than in solving them. And the new code in 3D, I would say it brings back some, some good scaling of all the steps and uh, and yeah we have a speed up that it's almost uh, two for this resolution here uh, okay so the coding 3d in the paper it, it comes with the use of uh, factorization but in principle it's uh, it, it, it's uh, fast to use a pcg looking at this paper here and um Okay, now just a few details about the implementations uh, and then we can discuss more in the questions and answers. Uh, so the improving of the setup of the stiffness operator, it comes essentially from using this routine that you can download from GitHub and directly use. And the bigger thing is that this routine makes uh, 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 possible to uh, specify your assembling coefficients as int instead of double precision. And this saves a lot of RAM and in principle makes the setup of the matrix 10 times cheaper, as you can see from the scalings here. Uh, and then a simpler thing and maybe a bit more immediate is uh, that, I mean, as long as we work with structural mechanics, I would say it's a good idea to set up just one half of your stiffness operator and, and this will save half the memory and the time. Okay, so um, another speed up is on the OC, as I said, and the optimization problem in itself is 
solved with a sequential linearization approach and each local optimization is solved by means of Lagrangian duality. And in the top 80 of eight, the way for computing the Lagrange multiplier was a line search on, a, I would say a blind guess for the domain where to do the line the search. So as long as the constraint is entirely linear, uh, lambda can be given this closed form expression that could be used for a very fast primal dual iteration that, as you can see here from the number of uh, uh, of bisections, let's say, it scales much better than the than the uh, solution of the bisection problem on on a, a large domain um, but uh, let's say in a more general situation where for instance you have some nonlinear effect on the design variables for instance because of the projection still uh, this expression can be used to bound your lagrange multiplier and so to select the window where to look for that again by line search and this will give you something in between as the number of bisection steps and finally if you can work with volume preserving operators of course uh, you don't need to refilter in all the steps and so and so this will this will uh, uh, make the OC very, very fast. Now I'm gonna go fast here. So as I said, the introduction of non-design domain is pretty simple. You can just define them with uh, a couple of set of farays that define the voids and the solid domain. And here you can see an example for the reinforcement of a frame that is solid and we want to keep this opening and place some reinforcing material inside here. You can see the uh, discussion in the paper. And uh, finally, so we recently extended the code to uh, buckling problems and creating, I would say, a quite comprehensive tool that can solve all these four examples. So the minimum volume and the minimum compliance selections will uh, essentially bring you back to a code with the same efficiency and with the same capabilities of uh, top 99 NEO. And uh, for having some real fun, now you can solve uh, problems with buckling load as an objective or as a constraint. And the code is uh, uh, short and is very fast and it exploit uh, the, the vectorization of all the operations in order to build your stress stiffness matrix essentially with a cost that uh, will uh, go close to the cost for the setting up of the elastic stiffness operator. And, um, and then, of course, you have to solve a, a Nigen value equation and that's pretty tough but there are some methodologies uh, uh, for doing that efficiently and we can have if you want a discussion about that so thank you for your attention if you have any questions or comments or remarks remark please ask now you can download the codes in the top up web page at dtu and please keep an eye on the top of webpage at jhu because now it's going uh, uh, it's having some renewal and uh, something new is going to come very fast thank you thank you very much federico <clears throat> very nice to see and very nice that you're pretty much taking to time so we do have time for questions yeah if i can stop sharing the screen i don't know why it's going so <laughs> Crazy this. Don't worry about that. That's that's just okay. one of the prizes. So 
of, of going online. So please butt in, you can write questions or you can simply just unmute yourself and ask. So I, I do have a, a basic question. So you're releasing something on buckling. What about vibrations? I guess that if you can do buckling, vibrations should be pretty- It's easy. Yeah, that's the point. So yeah. uh, vibration, I would say it's an extension that uh, from the point of view of, of, of um, because, you know, the problem is that uh, buckling needs the stress stiffness operator. And that's, that can be very slow to build uh, in a scripting uh, uh, setup like MATLAB, because you have to loop on all the, um, on all the, uh, domains in order to read the stresses and so so we decided to do this because uh, this was something where some smartness could be put and uh, make a procedure that in principle can be very slow very fast mm -hmm. vibration i would say that uh, the mass is pretty cheap to set up so then uh, there it's just a problem of how to solve your equations right Interesting. So I guess the next available online code is in the making already. So we do have some questions on the chat. So Manav Batia is asking if you use reduced integration for the stiffness matrix. No, no. The like for uh, vibration or for just the I, stiffness problem? Yes, this is for just the No, stiffness. I'm sorry, for the buckling or for stiffness? It doesn't really say, but it you can no, it. by the way, no, I use a uh, full, uh, full, uh, it is stiffness integration of the stiffness. Yes. And I also guess there's another question. So does the software only support uniform rectilinear ground measures? And if so, how easy or difficult is it to make them general for unstructured? Okay. So yes. Um, so the code uh, top 99 and this one here in 3D, they are for uniform structured meshes. Uh, and uh, this one is also for uniform structured meshes. But in principle, the same criterion that we use for vectorize the construction of the stress stiffness matrix can be used for building all matrices of a non-structured mesh uh, in one single step. The concept is the same. Like you, you have to vectorize all the all the things that would be uh, into loops, in principle. Yeah. Actually, we have more questions, but I think we will wait with those until we get to the end of all the talks. So I just hear from Boyan's co-authors of the work that he has some technical problems. So let's keep our fingers crossed that he will make it. Otherwise, one of them has actually volunteered to jump in, but we'll do that at the end. So if you manage to stop sharing. Better... Yeah, that's that's my problem. So I really don't know what's happening. Actually, I can do it for you. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks. No worries. So let's move on to the next presenter, which is going to be Yuan Ming Hu from the CSAIL group at MIT, who is going to tell us about some really amazing stuff on a, well, it's, I guess it's an expensive desktop computer, but still a desktop computer. Yeah. Okay. All right, let me try to share my screen. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Uh, let me just share desktop. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Yep. Awesome. So uh, thank you, Nels, for the invitation and for making everything happen here. Uh, so to, today I'm going to, going to talk about our SIGGRAPH Asia paper on narrow band topology optimization on a sparsely populated grid. And uh, this is a collaborative work with a lot of people from MIT and uh, also from University of Wisconsin-Madison and also from Dartmouth College. So uh, in the front page, I show some uh, pretty interesting results. So as you know, we're trying to solve the minimum compliance problem. Basically, uh, you, have a, you have a volume and you apply some force, you want to optimize for a structure, basically a standard topology optimization problem. And uh, as we all know, this is essentially a uh, constraint optimization problem. And uh, 
the design domain is a in our problem is a 3D density field or array with values in uh, zero or one between zero and one. And uh, in this talk, we're just to focus on the minimal compliance problem because uh, we are going to engineer a super high performance solver and it's important to keep our problem simple otherwise the code is will just quickly get unmanageable and we have a volume constraint and the key of our our paper of this work is a, a ridiculously ridiculously fast linear fdm solver and essentially uh, this is just a uh, extremely accelerated version of uh, of all this 99.9 uh, .9 version of topology optimization code in matlab and as we all know, like when we're trying to scale up topology optimization, the most time consuming part is going to be the FEM solve. And uh, uh, basically, we're just uh, iterating between density update and FEM solve. And we really need to speed up the FEM solve part. And on the other hand, we also want the topology optimization thing to be uh, have a very high resolution. As you can see, if you have a something like a very thin structure in with a coarse grid, it's almost impossible to capture that. And that's why we want to really scale up to a pretty high resolution background grid. So uh, the motivation of this work is basically uh, inspired by two very related work from people here. And uh, one of them is uh, Drink's single CPU topology optimization paper, which is kind of incredible. And we also run into Nail's uh, Nature paper on optimizing 1 billion voxel on a supercomputer. But we quickly run into a problem because we don't really have access to a HPC cluster. We only have a uh, 56 core uh, workstation in our lab. And uh, what we really want to achieve is that, uh, is that possible for us to somehow achieve 1 billion voxel topology optimization just on a single computer? And if we can do that, then basically everyone with uh, a single, single workstation with a decent amount of memory can actually do a very high resolution topology optimization. So inspired by two related work from, uh, from Wu et al and uh, Edge et al, we developed a super high resolution topology optimization solver just on a CPU on a single computer. So if we look at this bird beak structure, um, here we have, uh, this is actually optimized on a 3,000 by 2.4,000 by 1.6,000 background grid. If you mo just modify those numbers together, you get a ridiculously large number, which is something around 11.5 billion voxel. And uh, uh, this is just a, a too big number to fit in uh, any, to fit in memory of any single computer. So, uh, however, the good news is if we only account for the voxels within this bird be mesh instead of all the voxel in this bounding box, the number is much smaller. It's just a, a just around one billion, still a big number, but much smaller than eleven billion. And if it's actually only eight point six percent of all the voxels, so here's a visualization of the topology optimization process of this one billion voxel very big. And as you can see, by scaling up to very high resolution, we do get a lot of fine scale structure, which is uh, not surprising. So how do we actually leverage this kind of uh, uh, partial occupation of voxels in memory? Well, actually in modern computer architecture, we already have a virtual memory system and uh, uh, your CPU doesn't directly talk to your virtual memory. There is a page table and a translation local side buffer that translates virtual address into physical address. And the good thing about this system is that uh, physical memory nowadays is actually allocated on demand, meaning that if you allocate a huge chunk of virtual memory and you don't touch it, then it will never be occupied. That means uh, you will just uh, use partial a small part of the memory if you only touch a small part of it. So in physical memory, things are still continuous, but in virtual memory, it can be uh, a very sparse representation. So you can just occupy 1% of your virtual memory and it will only take uh, that 1% of your utilized part of in your physical memory. So the page table and uh, mapping, the page table mapping actually does this for you. And because we have a, we have a hardware called translation local set buffer or TLB, this kind of mapping is done by the hardware and it's ridiculously fast, super fast. So there, of course, there are a lot of data structure based on this hardware mechanism. And uh, one typical example is what we call sparsely paged grid or SP grid by 
uh, the Wisconsin people and they developed this method back to the year 2014. And basically the thing is uh, you can actually scale up your grid to 2D or 3D and uh, each block of your grid will be something like a four by four by four or eight by eight by eight voxels. And then uh, each block will have its space in physical memory if it's touched by your computer. By the CPU. So this actually allows us to allocate a huge chunk of grid, but only use a part, small part of it. And uh, the physical memory will only be consumed by the small part of um, region that we actually use. So here's a bridge optimization example. And you can see uh, starting from a dense grid, after just a few topology optimization iterations, you quickly uh, the simulation domain is quickly narrowed down to a very small fraction of the whole volume. So that's why we developed a narrow band tracking scheme that allows us to somehow uh, only use blocks that are around our structure. As you can see, we are allocating uh, a expanded domain of the current structure. This actually allows the structure to move slowly in space. And uh, this, allow this actually gives um, enables the solver to just utilize a very small fraction of the uh, whole volume and also not sacrificing accuracy because the structure is still able to evolve. And, and you know, like uh, usually in after 10 iterations of OC, usually the structure just evolves very, very slowly. It's basically fine tuning. So it's fine if we just uh, expand the simulation domain around the structure a little bit and ignore the majority of the blocks that were not really used. So here you can see uh, the blocks are actually uh, from a full domain and then to a narrow band and then gradually shift in space. So we developed a narrow band evolution uh, cycle, basically starting from the structure, we do a, a little bit of filtering that actually here we are removing some region that has too low density and we just ex exclude them in the optimization. And then we expand the simulation domain by a little bit. That allows the structure to sl slowly move in space. And after the expansion, we do the uh, topology optimization stuff on the narrow band. Uh, the, fin the final step we do is to evolve and shrink so that we still keep our uh, memory consumption in a reasonable amount of, uh, amount of memory space. Um, so the key of this system, uh, as we mentioned, is the FEM solver, and uh, we do build a multigrade FEM solver here. Although the MG, the multigrade preconditioned country gradient solver has linear complexity, something like ON, uh, is a linear time regarding the number of voxels, uh, there are still a lot of space for low-level performance engineering to make the system even faster. Uh, so we have developed an aggressively optimized small degree FEM solver, and we have an optimized fine level operator. We have a matrix ray gathering course in operator construction. So the thing is, because our grid is too big, uh, we cannot even build the whole sparse matrix in memory. We have to make almost everything matrix ray. And uh, this is actually one of the key to save memory space going matrix ray is key. And we also want to improve performance. So uh, we develop an improved eight color Gauss Seidel smoother to make cache utilization better. I'll go deeper into this later. So a maybe surprising fact nowadays is that nowadays CPUs are super scalar and uh, they can, each CPU core, uh, let's speak of Intel i7, they can issue two FMA, vectorized FMA instructions. And if you multiply those numbers together, each i7 CPU, let's say we have four cores, it can actually do 0 0.5 teraflops per uh, per second. This is, this is actually a ridiculous amount of uh, uh, computation power and we really did want to make use of it. So if we look at the fine level stiffness operator, basically uh, we are talking about multiplying U by K, the essential uh, FEM system here, like computing KU given U. So of course we're doing a, it's not affordable for us to actually build the steps in matrix K. So the only thing we can do is to consider the matrix as a linear operator and then directly uh, do the operation on, on U as if everything uh, is there. So it's actually a lot of computation and uh, it's super important to actually leverage the AVX512 or AVX2 in vector instruction sets on modern CPU because it's a lot of, this This is this part is, is essentially compute bound and we really want to leverage the flops, the throughput of CPUs. 
So uh, we mentioned that we are using a sparse grid where each block as a leaf level is something like four by four by eight voxel. And uh, there, because we're uh, applying a FEM stencil, it's essentially uh, something like a three by three by two by two stencil. And uh, we really, sometimes we really need to load a vector that is not only within the block, but also sometimes across different blocks. And here, uh, the solution we provided is to just uh, use uh, single instruction, multiple data load, and uh, we, we try to avoid use SIMD gather. Instead, we use SIMD blend. Basically, we're just uh, at compile time, we were able to infer the memory uh, address difference and then do two vectorized load, and then use a SIM, uh, SIMD blend to quickly blend data from different blocks. Um, and, uh, you know, for finite, for multigrade, it's sometimes important to actually build a cross level matrix. I just mentioned that for the fine level matrix, it's not possible for us to actually build it. But for the cross level matrix, for, for efficient preconditioning, we really need to build that. So uh, the funny thing is that uh, the process to build the matrix is matrix free. This is because uh, we, do, we do, not, do not have enough memory to store the finest level matrix. So what we do here is that um, we keep the top level matrix free and uh, then we just uh, build the, the uh, course level matrices using matrix three method. This is kind of uh, interesting. So how do we do that? Essentially, you know, in, we're using gallery style coarsening and uh, for multigrade, basically gallery coarsening, meaning that you're just uh, multiplying those top level stiffness step matrix by a few RNP matrices. And uh, this can actually done, be done in a matrix three manner. So uh, every time we need to construct a column of this course and matrix, we just do uh, we just start with a unit activation on the bottom, on the uh, course level, and then do propagation, uh, do prolongation restriction, so that we can actually compute one column of that matrix. So essentially, we're just doing a k multiplied by a unit activation, and then we get a column of the course and matrix which is a column of the K for each matrix here. So by applying this matrix for a gathering coarsening, um, we can actually achieve a pretty high uh, memory bandwidth and uh, flops utilization on our Skylake CPU. And this actually allows us to efficiently build the multi-grade hierarchy. Uh, the final low-level optimization I'm going to talk about today is a eight-colored Gauss-Seidel smoother. We need to modify that so that we can have a higher usage of cache lines. So as we all know, when we're talking to the physical memory, we never the CPU doesn't talk to that uh, in a byte-to-byte -byte manner. Instead, we're talking to the caches in a unit of four, uh, 64 cache lines. And uh, uh, if we just use half of the cache lines, then you're wasting half of the memory bandwidth. So this is kind of problematic for a traditional eight color gauss Seidel smoother because every cache line actually has data from different colors. And uh, you know, in every iteration of a gauss Seidel iteration, you, on, you only deal with one color. So if we stick to the original data layout, we're wasting, because in each cache line, we can only utilize one color, we're wasting a lot of memory bandwidth. So that's why we use a shuffle data layout here so that each cache line has only data from one color. And this allows us to uh, improve bandwidth utilization by a factor of eight. So this allows us uh, to utilize 80, 68 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth out of 120, which is a pretty decent amount of memory utilization. Just some uh, optimization results. Here we are optimizing for a bicycle wheel with different loading and boundary conditions. And we also try to reproduce the plan wing optimization uh, inspired by the nature paper. But of course we didn't uh, really look into the boundary condition and loads. This is just a uh, somehow a relatively simple rep reproduction of the uh, plan wing structure. Here's a cutaway view of the uh, fine internal structures. So in summary, it's important to use a sparse grid and uh, we really want to keep the evolution in a narrow band. And the key to our high performance is a aggressively low level hand engineered solver. 
uh, that actually speeds up the FEM solve. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, performance in numerical computation is mostly about how do you actually utilize the vectorization unit and how to utilize your data. And uh, data layout and effective vectorization is super important. Uh, and we do, as you can see, this kind of a low level engineering can be pretty crazy and uh, it's not easy to get started with. And we do need a better programming language and compiler to reduce the development cost for higher performance computation. And guess what? We did write a compiler for that. And that's why uh, we write a Tai Chi paper. So Tai Chi is a programming language and compiler that can allow everyone to write high performance CPU or GPU code on sparse grids in a programming language like Python. So basically everyone who knows how to write Python can uh, learn to write Tai Chi in just after just a one hour course. And we do have a, uh, it's open source and we have a lot of developers working on this. And uh, this is a full simulation written in Tai Chi. As you can see, we have this kind of a complex data structures uh, from multi-level and uh, we do uh, this, uh, you write the system in Python and it runs on GPU, which is pretty crazy. It's pretty convenient. Okay, so that's it. And our code is on GitHub. So this is not in Python code. This is still low level C++ code. Hopefully one day we can rewrite that in Python, uh, but it's, uh, we haven't done that yet. Cool, so that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuan Ming. I mean, it is amazing to see the results you are able to get on a single slightly expensive desktop computer. So there's already some questions and I thought if, if you look at the hands raised, uh, Feng Wing was the first. So Feng Wing, please ask your question. Hi, Nish. That's a question for previous uh, presentation, but uh, you didn't notice. Could you lower? Feng Wing, then we take that one at the end. I also collected yeah. some questions. So let's stick to a question for Yuan Ming now and then move on. Uh, Joe, you're next in line. Yeah, hi, thanks for the presentation, very interesting. So I was just wondering, so you do this uh, boundary tracking in order to sort of reduce the computational space. So does that mean that at the beginning of the optimization where you don't really have an interface, you essentially have to solve the full problem still? That's, that's very true. That's actually one of the drawback of the system. Uh, this is basically because initially you, ha you still have to do the computation in the full domain. So right. one solution to that, however, is that you start with a coarse grid, and then after a few iterations, you get a uh, get a coarse, uh, you, get, you get a kind of a structure in the coarse grid, and uh, you mm -hmm. don't have that many voxels in the coarse grid, and then you just right. initialize a fine grid in a narrow band. Uh, that's kind of a one solution, potential solution, but we didn't actually explore in that direction just because the system complexity, we really yeah, want to yeah. keep the system still simple. Right, thanks. Great question, thank you. So there's a question in the chat from Tim Kuipers, which I'm not sure I understand, but maybe you can. He's asking if it could help to speed up if you could store nearby voxels using the Hilbert order. Hmm. So I think that's a great question, but I just don't understand what is nope, help so order. You could <laughs> put in and tell us what it's what it's all about. Could you maybe explain a little bit, Tim? Uh, so what um, is the order? 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 That would be my main question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have can I can I ask one question while we're waiting? Because mm -hmm. I mean, is there any hope? I mean, for this fast grids to be applied on unstructured meshes? or does it rely on a logical mesh? That's a great question. So um, by unstructured mesh, do you mean like uh, still hex mesh with adaptivity or something like tetrahedral mesh? Or a mix, but uh, preferably hexahedral if possible. Yeah, I, I think tetrahedral is slightly more difficult because allowing a tetrahedral mesh in linear memory is trickier than uh, somehow laying out hex, hex meshes. Uh, but for adaptive meshes, I think uh, it's definitely possible. Uh, I mean, if you just do a graded adaptive hex mesh, then we can still somehow utilize a, you can just use multiple sparse grids, like one for each adaptivity level, like, uh, and then, uh, and then basically you can still utilize the SP grid or Tai Chi data structures. And then that will allow you to get both performance and adaptivity for topological optimization. So you're not saying it's impossible? It's not. It's definitely not impossible, uh, but I, I think it's uh, a little bit more work. Uh, <laughs> and it's definitely do doable if we have a something like a compiler for adaptive computation, but uh, it's not yet done. So for Tai Chi, we only 
for now we only support uh, our first class citizens are like single resolution sparse grids, and uh, you can use multiple to compose into an adaptive grid, but it's not yet first class support in Kaichi. And maybe uh, one more question before we move on to Gustavo's talk, and this is from Marek Fatia, and it's also a question on my list. It is, what is the background needed for engineers to actually write accelerated codes at this level? Uh, I think that's a great question because writing that kind of code is, to be honest, really painful. And uh, you do have to learn a little bit of uh, computer architecture and uh, like the memory hierarchy and uh, maybe also a little bit of uh, assembly language, CPU microarchitecture. It's kind of a not really pleasant, uh, like the, the code writing part is not the most pleasant thing, but it's great to see we can run very high resolution, but I, I have to admit like uh, writing high performance code is not a productive thing. Like you have to spend months or years optimizing your software. That's why we have Tai Chi that allows you to write high performance code using Python, which is a, a pretty interesting thing to, to try. Okay. So Tai Chi is the, I guess, the path for mechanical engineers and other morsels in this game. I'm going to keep some of the questions set in the chat if we have time for them later. And uh, let's, for now, move on to the next talk, which is going to be by Gustavo da Silva. He's going to talk about stress constraints. So please, Gustavo, share your screen and start. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Gustavo da Silva, a postdoc at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And today I'm going to talk about the augmented Lagrangian approach for hundreds of millions of constraints. This presentation is based on the paper Three Dimensional Manufacturing Tolerant Topology Optimization with Hundreds of Millions of Local Stress Constraints. The motivation to use the augmented Lagrangian method in topology optimization came from the stress constraint problem, in which the number of constraints is usually equal to the number of elements in the mesh. This is especially challenging for very large scale three dimensional problems where the number of elements may be larger than 100 million, resulting in topology optimization problems with more than 100 million design variables and 100 million stress constraints. In this presentation, I am going to focus on the volume minimization problem with von Mises stress constraints. However, the augmented Lagrangian method can be employed to solve any topology optimization problem. And the main objectives of the base paper are to demonstrate the applicability of the augmented Lagrangian method to solve very large scale three-dimensional problems with stress constraints and also to extend, investigate, and validate a robust formulation to handle manufacturing uncertainty in three-dimensional stress-constrained problems. The main techniques employed to handle stress constraints in topology optimization are the aggregation techniques. However, we also have a few alternative techniques like the augmented Lagrangian method that I described in this presentation to solve the problem and to provide nice results as well. So a few definitions, we use SYNC for stiffness interpolation, the epsilon relaxation function for stress interpolation and the density filter with threshold projection to compute the physical relative densities. In order to solve the problem, we can directly apply the augmented Lagrangian method where we first set the augmented Lagrangian function as a combination of the original objective function and all these stress cons constraints aggregated into a single sum. And it's important to mention here that the augmented Lagrangian function is differentiable, so we can use some gradient, first order gradient based algorithm uh, able to handle bound constraints to solve the optimization of problems. And these are set as the minimization of the augmented Lagrangian function subjected to only bound constraints. So the augmented Lagrangian method is a sequential procedure where we first set uh, an optimization sub problem up to a prescribed tolerance or maybe a fixed number of iterations like 20 iterations in the paper. And then we update the Lagrange multipliers and penalization parameter and we solve the next optimization sub problem and so on. 
we can perform this procedure until some convergence criteria are reached. It's important here to normalize the initial and maximum penalization parameters by the uh, number of stress constraints to alleviate mesh dependence effects. Here's an outline of the algorithm employed in the paper to solve the topology optimization problems. And it's important to mention here that we have to compute the sensitivities of the augmented Lagrangian function only, every iteration of the optimization problem at the cost of only one adjoint problem per physical density field. So we have to solve one adjoint problem in the deterministic case and three or more adjoint problems in the robust case. And then we can update the design variables using either the steepest descent method with move limits as described in the appendix D of the paper or the MMA particularized to handle bound constraints only. And in these cases, the update procedure is embarrassingly parallel and easy to implement in the PET based framework. It's important to mention here that uh, it's important to remember actually that we are handling the optimization sub problem. So we have to compute the sensitivities of the augmented Lagrangian function only because all the stress constraints are uh, taken into account already in the objective function. So here we have the deterministic formulation, the standard deterministic formulation on the left and the proposed robust formulation on the right. And the difference is that in the robust formulation, we minimize the volume of the dilated topology and we apply the stress constraints over each physical density field that is on the eroded, intermediate, and dilated topologies. And the difference between the proposed robust formulation for three-dimensional design and the original robust formulation for uh, two-dimensional stress constraint design is that the three-dimensional problems with stress constraints are much more sensitive with respect to uniform boundary variations. So we had to use the double filter approach by Christiansen and co-authors uh, to compute the physical relative densities in order to handle this issue. Now I'm going to show you a few results. First, the three-dimensional version of the L-shaped problem. Here we have the deterministic solution on the left and two robust solutions for two different tolerance ranges in the middle and on the right. Uh, we can see that the robust solutions have identical topologies and the deterministic topology is different. Uh, we can also see here that the deterministic solution is much more sensitive with respect to uniform boundary variations because the maximum von Mises stress value increases with either dilation or erosion operations. And on the other hand, we can see a much, uh, <clears throat> much less sensitive result here uh, in the robust cases because all these stress constraints are satisfied from the most dilated topology to the most eroded topology considered during the optimization procedure for both robust cases. We have also performed a mesh dependency study where we solved the same robust problem with stress constraints for three different meshes. A coarse mesh with 2 million elements, a median mesh with 16 million elements, and a fine mesh with 131 million elements. And we can see here a very small difference between the coarse mesh solution and the median mesh solution because in the coarse mesh solution we have one hole less However, uh, when analyzing the median mesh solution and the fine mesh solution, we can see identical topologies with very small differences in shape. We can also see here uh, the optimized volume fractions uh, where we can see almost the same volume fraction for all topologies uh, indicating that in this case, we uh, get an almost mesh independent solution when applying the augmented Lagrangian formulation to solve this problem. We have also performed a body fit, a body fitted uh, validation on our voxel based results from topology optimization uh, using the COMSOL software, where we observed less than 10% of difference between the maximum von Mises stresses from both body fitted and voxel based models. Uh, for all topologies between the most dilated to the most eroded, and for all cases of the paper. Here I have an animation where I show all the COMSOL models 
sorry for that. All the console models from the most dilated to the most eroded. We can see that the most eroded solution topology actually is the most stressed one among, the, uh, among all the topologies as expected. However, the most dilated topology has also a few points under the maximum stress value next to the sharp corner. Finally, I'm going to show you uh, the solution of the three-dimensional version of the crack problem by Mendorfer and Fancello. And in this case, we performed a numerical comparison between the standard robust formulation for compliance-based design and the proposed uh, stress-constrained robust formulation uh, for the same volume fraction. And in this case, I'm showing the intermediate topologies from three different viewpoints. We can see that we uh, get here different topologies. And here it's interesting to observe the crack region where we observe a very small rounded corner in the compliance based case because we are using the robust formulation which imposes a minimum length scale in both solid and void regions. However, it is very small uh, rounded corner was not enough to completely alleviate the vulnerabilities the stresses at the crack region, uh, contrary to what happens in the stress constraint case, uh, where we have a more pronounced rounded corner and the stresses are completely alleviated at this region and next to the yield stress value indicating that all the stress constraints are satisfied in this case. Uh, it's important to note here that the compliance-based result has a compliance almost 30% lower than the stress-constrained result. And this is justified because the objective of the compliance-based formulation is to minimize the worst case compliance, that is the eroded compliance. And we do not take compliance into account in the stress-constrained formulation. On the other hand, we can see that in the compliance-based result, we have a maximum for misses stress value almost 100% higher than the stress constraint result. And this is also justified because in the compliance based, based formulation, we do not take uh, stress constraints into account. So this was my presentation. I would like to thank the sponsor agencies for the funding provided to the development of this work. And also to, to thank all of you guys for your time and attention and to thank Professor News for the invitation. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation, Gustavo. It's already a lot of questions in the, in okay. the chat and I'll get to them just shortly. Uh, uh, Juan, we still have not heard from, from Boyan. So if possible, I, and you are able to step in on such short notice, please prepare your presentation on the new preconditioner. You get some. You get some time. Just let me know. Okay. So I don't know if the people who have written in the chat wants to ask themselves. Otherwise, I can do it, of course. So uh, Pierre is asking how many stress constraints are still violated over one at the end of the optimization, Gustavo. Uh, actually, we employ a, a tolerance of five percent on the stress constraints and. Using this tolerance of 5%, uh, we have no stress constraints violated. So no All stress constraints are satisfied. So maybe I could just ask one more question along that line. So what if you put zero instead of 5%? <laughs> because it's very hard to, uh, to satisfy all the stress constraints considering a, a so small tolerance using the augmented Lagrangian method. Hmm. So, yeah, so I, I guess it's almost uh, impossible. We oh. have to use a uh, positive tolerance in this case to achieve uh, results faster. Okay, so maybe this leads directly to a question from Mohamed Tarek. So he's asking, would you say the augmented Lagrangian algorithm is hard to fine tune for problems spanning multiple orders of magnitude and how long does it take to converge compared to MMA using one of the aggregation approaches? Uh, regarding the time, uh, we are actually developing a, a work uh, where we are comparing the augmented Lagrangian method and the p-norm uh, or any other kind of aggregation techniques. And uh, to achieve the same level of, of results, we have almost the same number of 
of iterations. And which one, which were the other questions? Uh, the besides, last, besides number of iterations? It was how does it, I mean, it was basically this which you're spanning. Well, I guess the, the, you answered the last part. So the first part was, uh, would you say it's hard to fine tune the augmented Lagrangian algorithm? Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> the question is, are, are the parameter tuning complicated? Do you need to run multiple runs to get it to work? How complex is it just to get a working scheme? Uh, I guess it's not so complicated. When you solve, uh, for instance, the L-shift problem, you can solve any other problem using the same set of, of numerical parameters. Uh, we have presented the uh, parameter uh, updating scheme in that in the paper, and we you can use the same set of parameters to solve almost any problem. Hmm. Actually, any problem we tried, we could solve with uh, the same set of parameters. I can see Mohammed. Oh, you are you have one more question? You can just unmute and ask. Oh uh, yes. So I just wanted to expand. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I wanted to expand on this question because in my experience when implementing the augmented Lagrangian algorithm, choosing the right uh, optimizer can be hard. Uh, fine tuning, for example, if you do like a first order optimization algorithm, uh, choosing the right line search algorithm and, and step size and all that stuff can be hard to, uh, to fine tune, uh, even for the dual optimizer, like when you update the, the Lagrangian multipliers, especially if you have constraints in, in like an order of magnitude and objective in a different order of magnitude. Yes, I'm not yes, sure yes, if this yes. is an experience that you had, or maybe you're, you, you had a better implementation than mine. No, no, no. Uh, actually, uh, actually, I have uh, a lot of experience with the augmented Lagrangian method. I've been working with this method for six, seven years, I guess. And uh, at the beginning, we tried uh, a few solvers to, to solve particularly this stress constraint problem. And we found that uh, the steepest descent method with move limits, as I present in the appendix D of the paper, is a nice choice of method, uh, at least for these stress constraint problem using hundreds of millions of constraints. I cannot say about other uh, classes of problems. We have also solved the compliant mechanism design problem using stress constraints and also using uh, geometric nonlinearity and stress constraints using the same solver. Uh, but yeah, I, I tried a, a few solvers before uh, getting these, <laughs> this last one that uh, we have presented in the paper. Is the implementation online or is it not, uh, not published yet? And the implementation is not online yet. Okay. And maybe I can get in touch offline and we can talk more about this. Okay, yes. Thank you for your question. Thank you. No. But one. Uh, cool. mm. Also, it's going to take off. Uh, hey, Niels, I, I guess I have been having some problems here. I couldn't hear you either. I don't know what it's my problem or the other side. Uh, I can hear you, John. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Niels. Disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, are you also not hearing anything? Uh, hi, Gustavo. I have a, a simple question. So you use the Ipsilon relaxation. Uh, there's also the QP relaxation. Why do you choose uh, Ipsilon? Do you can you comment on that? Uh, yes, actually, I tried both. I started using the QP relaxation when I started. Uh, using the augmented Lagrangian method to solve the stress constraint problem. I guess in 2016 or 17. And I started solving some uh, stress constraint problems uh, with uh, uncertainty in applied uh, load intensity and direction. And I realized that using the QP approach for uh, handling 
the problem when uncertainties in direction are applied, uh, we may get a, a nasty problem and the epsilon relaxation function seems to, to better uh, control this issue. It seems to be more stable okay. you know, from uh, uh, my experience with the problem, but I guess one could achieve these deterministic results using the QP approach as well. Uh, there's one comment from Pierre. Uh, he said, uh, Epsilon 0 0.2 is not too loose. Yeah, maybe it's small. precise. So if you 0 0.1, it's maybe the, related to the fact you cannot obtain 1.00. The two are covered. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Pierre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, actually, this value of uh, epsilon here uh, we choose based on our uh, first paper on robust stress design, where we tried uh, several values to try to, to get stress accuracy on the interface between the solid and void regions, allowing a very small, a very thin layer of soft transition boundary between the solid <coughs> and void faces. So actually, from our experience in topology optimization, if you have a, a, a full black and white uh, topology, you can use any uh, function to get the same level of stress because we will have zero stresses when we have zero density and full stress when we have full density. Uh, however, when we uh, use density-based topology optimization, actually in, in black and white topology uh, optimization, we, we will have the effect of the jagged boundaries, you know, and it may lead to some instabilities. So we use density-based topology optimization and we uh, have some level of gray regions and it, we verify that if you allow a very thin layer of soft transition boundary between solid and void region and we use sync equal to three and this epsilon relaxation function with epsilon equal to 0 0.2 we have a uh, very nice uh, stress accuracy at the interface between solid and void regions. We tried uh, epsilon, smaller values of epsilon, but uh, it seems that the maximum stresses uh, oscillate after uniform boundary variations and uh, it becomes unstable. Okay. I'm not sure if I answered your question, Pierre. Otherwise, I think we'll take it later. Otherwise, in the interest of time and speaking of technical issues, I was just thrown off the internet and back again now. So, Juan, are you uh, ready? Yes, I'm here. Can you listen to me? I can hear you perfectly good. So could you please just check to the screen sharing that everything is working? Let's and see. thank you very much for jumping in at absolutely no notice whatsoever. OK, I think uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for invitation. And then uh, this talk should be Boyan Lazarov, uh, the one who gives this talk, but uh, he's experienced some technical problems. And then uh, we apologize uh, for the inconvenience with the, with the seminar. So I, I want to see if you are uh, watching my screen so I can continue. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So this is gonna be. This is. These are not Boyan's slides. So this is uh, slides on uh, work related with with the work Boyan is gonna or was planning to present. And then I'm gonna show you some results, but uh, from a proof of concept code, the real application results. Uh, Boyan was planning to show, right? But then he couldn't send me the presentation. So I apologize for, for the simplicity of the topology optimization part of the presentation. You are all experts, but let me just try to make some points that uh, we consider very important. So this is a, 
a general topology optimization problem where you minimize some functional subject to some uh, physical condition modeled by a partial differential equation with some restrictions. So in our proof of concept code, we use uh, moving asymptotes method, uh, and then uh, we do some simple filtering and some simple penalizations. You are all experts, sorry about that. But then what I wanted to point out is that, um, well, in our proof of concept code, we consider topology optimization problems related to the heat equation and related to the elasticity equation. The elasticity equation problem is a minimum compliance problem. And then this could be, for example, for the elasticity equation, our problem in continuous setting, where we have to minimize the compliance and then we have a functional that we want to minimize subject to some conditions. This is a density formulation. So we have some conditions on the total volume. And then uh, we have this restriction, which is the PD restrictions. So all, all of you know, know about this, sorry about my simple comments and maybe not very precise ones. But when you discretize this, for example, using finite elements, what you have to minimize is, uh, well, you have to solve the discrete problem which is optimization problem with the same restrictions, but in a discrete uh, interpretation. And then if it's finite elements, you will have a uh, stiffness matrix that you have to solve every time you propose a new density. And then, uh, so you can advance in the optimization. Um, all of you were commenting about this. If you are use uh, finite elements in the optimization problem, I have to solve a finite element problem in each optimization iteration. As you need fine meshes, this is a very large problem. And then in my community of numerical analysis, we call this problem multi-scale because it has a, a very fine features that you have to resolve with the mesh. And also the problem is sometimes you regularize, like for example, when there is no density, you put a very low value in the solver and then you will have uh, densities of value one in some regions and very small values in other regions. Uh, and then this, we call this the contrast, the ratio between these two values. And it is known that if you use iterative method for the finite element problem, uh, this affects the time or the number of iterations in the, in the, in the finite element solve. And you were commenting about this, most of the time you spend solving the physics, right? So let me show you what we did was uh, basically when you solve the finite element problem in terms of solving the problem, we use a preconditioner uh, similar to the ones we, we they were describing in previous talks uh, in the style of multigrid methods, but this uh, we'll call it domain decomposition method. So what I'm gonna show you is how to construct the preconditioner and some results in our uh, proof of concept MATLAB code. So let me review some domain decomposition concept. This is gonna be uh, very fast. So I wanna uh, have time to show the details about domain decomposition, but I want you to, to, to have an idea. So I have a mesh and I have a domain and a mesh where I want to solve an equation. For example, a heat equation or an elasticity equation, uh, like a heat equation like this. And I discretize this for finite element. So I have to solve something like this. Then I'm gonna construct a preconditioner. It's gonna have two parts. One part is a domain decomposition, one level solves. What you do is uh, you go to subdomains and then you have to be able to solve your equation, the same equation in subdomains. So you will have to solve this equation in this subdomain, you will solve the same equation with some uh, boundary condition you have to impose. I won't talk about that, but this is very important. The boundary conditions you put on the boundary of the local domain, and then you will have a local solution. And then you do that for other subdomains you go, right? And then you, are sh you, you have to be sure that you can cover your whole subdomains with patches like this, where you can solve local problems, right? And then what you're gonna do is uh, you will have local solutions in local subdomains, you will have these patches. So in these patches, you will solve for your equation. 
this is a smaller problem, of course, you can do it faster, you can do it in parallel. And then what you're gonna go is you're gonna add those solutions. You extend by zero outside the region where you solve and you add them. And then this is, a, this is of course not the solution, but this is an approximation of the solution. So doing that, restricting uh, the right-hand side to local domains, solving and extending and adding, I will call that uh, one level domain decomposition operator. And then this is not the solution, but I can use that as a preconditioner. So instead of solving my finite element problem, I will solve with a gradient, conjugate gradient, precondition conjugate gradient. Uh, this system where applying these operators involved going to local subdomains and solving uh, locally the equation, right? This is one part of the preconditioner. The second part is the following, which is the, the most important probably, is based on a domain decomposition multi-scale method. So in this kind of, in these problems, like is the ones you have, you have two meshes. You have a fine mesh that really describes what you want to solve. Like in your case, you are in a, the middle of a topology optimization iteration. You will have very fine details that you need to find mesh to describe them. But uh, it's just very large problem that you are not able to solve fast. And you would like to approximate this problem by uh, using a coarse mesh, a mesh like this with coarse elements in each coarse element, you have several fine meshes, mesh, fine mesh elements, and then you can compute on the coarse scale fast. But on the fine scale, that's what you need. You cannot compute fast. One way to use the coarse mesh is the following. You will go, and then you will do a finite element in the coarse mesh. But this is not the finite element where you just declare the functions, the basis function. This is a finite element where you compute the basis functions. Then you go to each region and you will compute locally some solutions of the equation to construct basis functions. Let me show you one example. Well, well. Then you go to each neighborhood and you construct some bases, and then you put together those bases and this is, you do a Galerkin projection on those bases. So you will project the very fine, very big system to a core system. And then the size of this system is gonna depend how many basis functions you have. You can have one per, coarse mesh or more, depending on what you need. And that, that solution, I call it second level of the precondition. Let me show you what we do in this part to construct the basis functions. What we do in this part to construct the basis function is the following. We have this coarse mesh, and then we have to construct uh, a basis function for a neighborhood, for this neighborhood. And then we study the operator here. And then locally we compute some eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this operator. And then with this information that we got from the eigenvectors, we construct some basis functions, right? For example, for the heat equation, uh, you have some functions like this. For the heat equation, this is one eigenvector. And then you probably, you want to multiply by partition of unity depending if you want to conform in discretization or not. And this is a basis function. And then in each neighborhood, you have one, two, three, as many fun basis functions as you need to get a good approximation. We call this coarse approximation, okay? Then let me, and then we can do it for elasticity equation also. So in the elasticity equation case, you have to study the elasticity operator locally. And then this K that, that comes here and this C, they are, uh, they depend on the density you have in the optimization iteration. And then you study this operator locally. This can be done in parallel. You take out some spectral information and then you construct the basis functions. And then what we do, for example, this is an example of, of this neighborhood. We have uh, an optimization that is very rigid in the black part and very soft on the white part. And then we show that the information you need to get is uh, corresponding to the first six modes six mode because there is two regions here. And then the six mode has to do with some rigid body motions on these two regions. And then if you include these six modes, you, you have some approximation that is good. That's what we show, we have a theory for that. Let me skip this. And then what we do is we add those local solutions you saw before with this coarse scale approximation. And this is our preconditioner. So instead of solve AU equal to B for the, but linear solve one optimization iteration, we solve 
with a PCG, preconditioned conjugate gradient, we solve this, this guy here. So in each iteration, we apply the matrix and then we apply the preconditioner, which involves the construction of those basis functions. This is, um, this is uh, sorry about this. This is an example. For example, with the heat equation, if you have a uh, design like this and you will advance in the optimization, you have to solve with the PCG, right? If you use no preconditioner, of course, uh, if your regularization is lower and lower, that, that, that's what you want, you will get more iteration, that means more time. But if you use our preconditioners, you get uh, more or less the same number of iteration. It doesn't matter how small is the regularization. And then let me show you some results here. This is for the heat equation. This is a proof of concept code. And then this is the, uh, this is the problem, basically. And this is uh, the, of the, the cost functional. And these are the PCG iteration. If you do, don't use the preconditioner, you need 500 iterations in each optimization step. If you use the preconditioner, you use 20 iterations. And this is the number of basis functions for the second part of the preconditioner that you need. And then uh, like in every iteration here, we are, we are computing the basis. If we change iteration, we change the basis, but uh, this is, uh, you don't need to do, to do this. You can just uh, select some times here in the, in the optimization where you pre-compute pre the basis functions, right? And then you reuse them in the, in the others, other steps. This is, uh, for example, the advance of the design. And since this is stabilized at the end and the, it converges the optimization part, then at the end, the basis function doesn't change anymore. So at the end, you don't need to, to recompute the basis. Let me just uh, show, this is other example, for example, here. The blue dots is the, the parts where we recompute the basis functions for the precondition. And then here you need uh, about 25 iterations every time in the optimization. If you don't use the precondition, you need like 500 iterations every, every optimization step. Let me use, just mention something, something else is the following. When we construct the preconditioner, it's more expensive to do it for the elasticity equation. It's cheaper for the heat equation because you know the elasticity equation is a vector equation. So it's two or three times more expensive than the heat equation. But what we show is we can construct the preconditioner for the heat equation and use it as a blockwise uh, manner to precondition the elasticity equation. And it still works fine. Let me use, show you some example. And we have some, some, some ways to reuse the basis from the heat equation for the elasticity equation in the second part of the precondition. So the message is we can pre-computing things for the heat equation or, the, or for the heat optimization problem to precondition the elasticity optimization problem. Let me show you some, some examples. And then here, uh, this is a elasticity final density example. This is the minimum compliance problem. And then this is our iteration. So this is the, this is the, the, uh, the cost functional, and this is our iterations in each optimization step. So we need, if you don't use preconditioner, you, you cannot solve this. If you use a preconditioner that uh, is not good, you need 500 iterations. If you use our preconditioner, you need 550 iterations in each solve of the optimization iteration. And the blue dot is the parts where we decided to recompute the course basis functions to just not uh, allow this iteration number to rise. So basically that was uh, what we did. We have several versions to compute those basis functions from the heat equation and pass them to the elasticity equation, right? And then these are the results from our proof of concept code. But then uh, Boyan was uh, preparing to show you some very uh, real problem practical results, but then unfortunately he, he couldn't come. But uh, uh, I hope I, I did uh, I did pass an idea of our work, and then I can take questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. And really, I mean, it's very much appreciated that you were even able to do this basically with no notice. So uh, I can see Joe. He has a question. So please, Joe. Joe, you are muted. Yes. Silly me. Yes, thank you. 
thanks for the presentation. So I worked with Boyan back during my PhD on applying MSFEM for, uh, yeah, for, for topology optimization. Um, what is, uh, in terms of performance, what does it give that you add the decomposition or domain decomposition uh, to the MSFEM uh, preconditioner uh, rather than just using the MSFEM as a preconditioner? Well, uh, actually, this is what I wanted to, to do when I talked to Boyan first time. What I wanted to do was uh, to use only the coarse part as a, as a solver for the for the problem. Right. Right. Here, here I have two parts, so I have uh, this second part is the one I compute on the coarse grid. Sure. But uh, we tried several experiments and didn't work. We really need to go. Uh, and solve the fine scale problem, not the coarse scale approximation. It doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't compare to the optimization step. And then here, here we really need to go for the fine problem and then use it only as a precondition and not as a solver. Right. And it, sure. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that. But what does the uh, what does the M1 add to the the efficiency? The M1, what it adds really is uh, that uh, your number of iterations won't depend that on the mesh size. Okay. Yeah. And then the M2, what adds is it doesn't depend that much on the coefficient on the density you have. Right. Okay. Then if you have a small mesh, you need both. Okay. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, Julian, you can just ask a question or I can read it out loud. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation, Juan. Um, I, I was just curious as to what is the cost of building the preconditioner? So we're obviously saving a lot of computational cost by, or you're obviously saving a lot of computational cost by having um, fewer uh, conjugate gradient iterations, but uh, how, how much does it cost to compute these preconditioners? Well, the cost of the preconditioner, uh, well, the local problems, uh, you, you, you have several options. The local problems, you, want, you, you can pre-compute some, some factorization of the local matrices and then store them or just uh, have a good solver for them. The, the really problematic part is the construction of the course basis, where you need to go to local neighborhoods, then you have to go to local neighborhoods and solve this eigenvalue problem. And then here you put here the fine resolution. This of course can be done in parallel, but you have to do it every time in a while during the optimization. So we co compute some basis and then we run the optimization, we use the preconditioner. When we observe our iterations are rising, the number of iterations are rising, then we stop and, pre -com and compute again the basis, the local basis. So at that point, we have to stop uh, stop little bit in the optimization iteration and then solve these local eigenvalue problems. Then this is the real cost. But one good thing here is that you don't need to solve very precisely this local eigenvalue problem. With a rough approximation is enough, depending on how many basis functions you, you need locally. If, you're, if your ma mesh is fine enough and resolves geometry, you need few eigenvectors here. So if you need like five eigenvectors in this part, solving a maybe 20 by 20 eigenvalue problem, at 20 matrix, 20 dimension, it's enough. So that, that part we have control it, but this is the real cost for computing, computing those bases. And then in line in the optimization step, but this is not done in every iteration, just once in a while. Thank you. Yes, we have many more questions. So sorry if I'm not picking up the right ones first. So Federico, you have one on the efficiency. You are muted, Federico. Yeah. So thanks for the, the presentation. So uh, what's the efficiency of this preconditioner in terms of sides of the patches? Because I would say larger are the patches that you use for the domain, the comp position, the more uh, precise that should be, right? But also more expensive to build the vapor conditioner. So is there a break-even size that you can 
suggest? Yes, here, uh, well, you, you will have to solve this uh, course problem and local problems. So it depends on, on, on how you're gonna implement it. Because uh, what you want is that you can solve more or less at the same time, these local problems and also this course problem. Then depends on, on how, how you plan to solve these uh, local matrices problems. Right, depends on how much time you, you, mm -hmm. you are allowed yeah. by your machine restrictions or whatever to, to spend here solving this. And then you want that your course problem that I call a zero is spent about the same time solving. So this is, uh, so the, the course mesh cannot be too, too, too coarse, but not too fine. And the local problems also cannot be that big because you're gonna take more time solving this, but cannot be uh, too small either. So it depends okay. on, on, on your architecture, how you're gonna implement it. You have a good size that you can solve fast. And then if you have uh, as many, for example, as many processors to cover all, all the domain, then that's the size you will use. And then according to that, you set the course problem size also. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. So Alan, you also have a question. Do you want to pose it yourself? Oh, I can ask. So Alan is asking if you have compared the performance with direct solvers, and maybe I could add on to that. Have you compared the actual wall clock time cost with the multigrid solvers that was presented, for example, by uh, Yuan Ming? Uh, I haven't done uh, uh, like um, computational study comparing the times because, well, our code here, the one I can I can handle is a proof of concept code, so. It's in MATLAB, so there are many things that uh, are not uh, as efficient as they should be. Uh, so I don't have any numerical detail study, but I can say the following. One of the things of this preconditioner was done uh, for the case. Uh, remember that this is uh, that your density is between one, and then if you use the whole subdomain, you have to regularize the density. Do you have a small value of density in, at, in, in the white parts, right? the part where there is no material. And then uh, you want this taken to zero. What's gonna happen with the conditioners that are not this is as you go smaller and smaller, your number of iterations in any iterative method are gonna rise linearly with the, with the, with the contrast, which is F, F zero to the minus one. So if you use a regularization 10 to the minus two, you're gonna have some number of iterations and then if you change to 10 to the minus six, you're gonna have much more. And then as in practice, you want this regularization to be as small as possible. That's why we think these preconditions are good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. So would it, you have a question about reusing. Yeah, uh, yeah. the question was about the blue dots in, the, in one of the last slides. So the, the frequency of updates, is it fixed at a certain point or can you, you should be able basically to reduce the pace of frequency of the, of the updates of the preconditioner once you are more or less converging and the design changes are small, but it seems like you have an equal spacing like every 10 design iterations you decide to update the preconditioner. Yes, in this experiment, uh, we did uh, some, some, um, we allow some maximum number of iterations without reusing. But in a practical setting, what we do is uh, we just keep track of the number of iterations. For example, here is around 50, and we use the same precondition, but when we get, for example, like 60, 70 iterations, we recompute the basis. Yeah. This is the, the easy way to do it in practice. But here we were proving several things. We were trying to see some things. We, we have a maximum number of iterations without reusing. But uh, this is not a problem in practice. Okay, thanks. So thank you very much for all the nice presentations. I guess we are actually over time, but if somebody, oh, I have, sorry, there was another question. Could you please comment on implementing this framework to geometrically or material nonlinear problems? So how would the preconditioner hold for such problems? That's a good question. Uh, well, uh, 
depends how, how you do the non, the nonlinear. Uh, you mean nonlinear PDEs, right? Restrictions being nonlinear. Yeah, if you have if you if you have a nonlinearity either in the material or in terms of large or finite strains. Yeah, well, it uh, depends how you solve the physics there. If you use uh, an iterations like Newton or fixed point, then you end up with a, with a linear problem with, where, uh, where the same issues, right? So you can use the same preconditioner. The only yeah, thing that uh, make can you came up is uh, the recomputation of the, of the preconditioner. That may come up more often. So I guess it would be interesting to see if you could build the preconditioner for the first Jacobian matrix and then reuse that throughout the Newton steps. That would definitely be interested. Yeah, so, you use it until it, uh, it works for you. As long as it's not working, then you have to recompute it. Yeah, true. There's basically no way around that. I totally agree. So I guess we do have some time. If people have questions for any of the other presenters, you still have the possibility to, to ask them. So please fire away if you have something. I would definitely like to thank everybody for giving some such inspiring talks. I mean, I really hope that a lot more people will start working on just going really crazy large scale for whatever reason they might find useful. <clears throat> yes, I have a question to Federico. Yes, please. Federico. Hi, Feng Wen. Hi, Federico. I have a question regarding your fast assembly for stiffness metrics, right? Yes. A stiffness. Uh, no, stress stiffness. Then I was thinking yeah. uh, wh whether one can use it for geometric nonlinear problems. Yes. If I have, um, does the uh, stress stiffness require explicit um, uh, functions uh, of the relation between this displacement? Yeah. The fast assembly. Yes. Which yeah. If I can see the hyperelastic material, then it will be difficult to apply that, where are the uh, constitutive metrics? Yeah, yeah, I got your point. So yeah, uh, in principle, you can, uh, you, so let's say that um, my point is that in principle, if you sit there for a couple of days and you think how to write all the operations in one row, uh, you don't have to loop on all the finite of elements. And then maybe if you have a modified Saint Venant material, something like that, that brings some complication in the relationship between stresses and displacements, uh, you might not write all the operation in a single routine, but in principle, you can vectorize all the stuff and you don't have to loop. That's my point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And I'm, I have one question from the YouTube channel chat for you, you and Ming. And this, I think it's a good question because it goes to show that not all question has to be deeply scientific. The question is, why is the language called Tai Chi? Which is a good question. <laughs> That's a great question. So uh, I, I did try the many different questions. Uh, sorry, many different names for that. Uh, so, but Tai Chi is the only one that I... I can find that is short and uh, easy to pronounce it for both Chinese people and non-Chinese people, and also has some uh, has some uh, kind of a uh, Chinese culture in it, and also uh, in like you know like in traditional Chinese philosophy, one of the uh, most important things is to be simple, and I really want things to be simple. As it, as I showed today, uh, engineering a extremely complex finite element solver, like, like what I showed today is not an easy thing, but I want it to be easier so that more people can uh, be benefited from it. So that's why I picked the name Tai Chi. Okay. Well, well, from where I stand, I don't think Tai Chi looks uh, that simple. So Tim, <laughs> I know you had questions before which you did not get to ask and that we did not understand. So please take them now. Yeah, so I'll try to explain. Uh, so uh, this was a question to uh, Yuan Minghu uh, on one of his last slides, which uh, I think pertains to like cache misses because uh, neighboring voxels are not stored uh, close to each other in memory. Uh, so what I was thinking is, so uh, in uh, generally what we do is we, for example, we have a, a 2D domain 
uh, and we have to store that in memory. So we have to linearize that. So what we generally do is uh, we store each of the uh, uh, each of the rows after each other in memory from this uh, 2D uh, domain. But uh, that way, so for example, if you have uh, like a domain of 64 by 64, then you know that each of the uh, vertical interactions between voxels is going to be across a different cache, right? So, uh, uh, so I was thinking maybe if you use the Hilbert order, uh, then you can uh, limit the number of, of cross cache uh, interactions like that. And so in, uh, you mentioned that you didn't really know the Hilbert order. So yeah, I now I know it. I, I thought it's like something mathematical, but I realized that you were just talking about uh, Hilbert, uh, Hilbert curves, right? In like how to how do you actually like linearize? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, we did try. We we, uh, we are using Z order curve or what people call Morton ordering. Mm -hmm. so that's one. Uh, that's something that is similar to here, but order and uh, it's easier to compute for uh, on on CPUs. Uh, basically, on x eighty six x sixty four, you have an instruction for you to easily compute the Morton coding. Uh, so, I guess Herbert coding will have similar performance improvement, comp uh, the same same performance improvement compared to Herbert coding. But uh, but the high level method I would like to say is that. Uh, whatever space filling curves you, we, ap we apply, we find that the improvement is pretty marginal. It's like uh, within 5%, I have to say, and uh, compared to considering the code complexity it introduces to the system, we sometimes just don't do it. And uh, that's, that's kind, of, uh, kind of sad because uh, ideally using this kind of a space filling curve does should ideally improve cache hit rate, um, but we, we didn't find that to be very helpful in practice. No, sure. I mean, if you're already using Z order, then the Hilbert order is just a marginal upgrade from there. And it also is more difficult to compute. So yeah, I get that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually mean that using the order or not is also a marginal improvement. So it's not a substantial thing. Uh, I guess that also depends on the computational pattern of your program. For some problem, for some programs, it may, be, it may be much more helpful. But on our problem, we didn't find that to be very helpful. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me there's uh, one question, which is a general one on multi-thread preconditioners. So I actually got to answer that myself. So this is Xiang Long is asking if it's difficult to extend multi-thread preconditioners for for unstructured meshes. And the simple answer to that is yes, it is simple. And the real answer is it just takes a lot of time. But if you do it on CPUs based on Petsy, it's actually almost just a lot of hard work and not too much thinking. And then the uh, next question, Federico, you have one for Juan? Yes. Uh, OK. Can, can I go? Can you hear me, Juan? We hear you. Good. OK. So, the, so as you said, the, the, the complicate point of the preconditioner is to compute eigenvalues and eigen modes for transmitting the solution right on the course scale that's the part that take some time right yes that's uh, so the part my question that... was about how sensitive is uh, the efficiency of the method with respect to the accuracy of this modes because in principle what i thought could be like if when you are on the core scale you can give uh, a kind of homogenized form of your coefficients then you can use something like a fast fourier transform or something like that for computing an approximate set of modes right yes uh, this is a very important point what we found is for example, you, if you want to use only the coarse part of the preconditioner, yeah. then you need uh, to compute. You, are need, you need to be very careful when computing the okay the, the mode. But if you want to use it only as a preconditioner, 
here uh, the accuracy of the eigen modes doesn't matter much even we have some randomized algorithms to approximate eigen values that works just fine okay yeah and then these are uh, randomized algorithms is very fast to compute the modes we need to put in the preconditioner okay yeah thanks and then maybe a small thing is uh, so the preconditioner will uh, do the thing if you have a um, how can i say a non-definite system of equations so you don't have the positive definiteness as you have in elasticity or heat equations uh it, i don't want to say i'm sure but i'm almost sure that it will do the work but you need a good uh, solver like for example you cannot use cg you have to okay. use some gm res gm res or something like that okay cool yes and the precondition yeah. should work okay thanks so mohammed you have one more question and i also think it's we are already past two so i guess it's time to round it up slowly um I, I have a lot of questions about the implementation of Tai Chi, but I don't think this is the right place to like uh, bother okay, everyone okay. with them. So I'll just like uh, take them offline. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to drop me an email. I'm happy to chat more. Excellent. Oh, of course, this is one of the main motivations why June originally suggested that we that we started these top webinars to bring people together, preferably who did not know each other in advance, and to advocate good ideas and in case of bad ideas also make sure they're not repeated too often so one final chance if somebody has something to ask about otherwise i would like to round off today's seminar and thank all the speakers especially juan for showing up and being able to present very very in quick notice and also i should boy and sense his best he actually got the techniques to work at the very end, but it was too late. So whenever we are going to have a next large scale session, I hope he will be able to participate. But uh, until then, June, do you want to say something about the next webinar maybe? Yes, our next webinar is uh, on the 24th of uh, November. It's organized by Julian, yeah. Excellent. And I guess we will send out notice whenever when time approaches. So with those words, thank you very much for participating and do feel free to contact any of us organizers. If you cannot find contacts for the person that you do want to talk to, we will be happy to, to connect you all. So thank you very much for taking part of today's event. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.